does everybody recognize this car? Does anybody recognize this car? It's, it's a Pinto. It's a 1979 Ford Pinto wagon. Now, did you know that there are people who have abandoned their current technology, like a Tesla, and they are driving around in these Pintos? So why might that be the case? Well, what I, what I turn to when I don't understand a phenomenon is my library of Canadian rock, because I'm Canadian and because it's got lots of insight. So let's have a listen to this. Right, so maybe they're abandoning their current technology because they feel nostalgic, right? Or maybe they're abandoning their current technology because they're more comfortable with something that they've used in the past. Um, now, you might be wondering, why am I talking about Ford Pintos and Canadian Rock? Well, I promise it's going to become clear over the next few minutes. Uh, my name's Shane McIntosh, and that went backwards. So um, together with one of my postdoctoral trainees, um, I wrote a study earlier last year about people and groups who were abandoning basil. Um, and I'm here to talk to you guys about this. Now, before I did a little bit of research, I was a little bit nervous about coming to BasilCon to tell you about organizations that are leaving basil, right? But then I did a little bit of uh, searching on social media, and it turns out that um, apparently University of Waterloo interns are what keeps the lights on around here. Um, there's some social media folks who were saying this is what Silicon Valley looks like, and there's a very important pillar that's uh, the University of Waterloo interns. And there were even like some famous talking heads who <laughs> agreed with this statement. So maybe there are some University of Waterloo alumni in this room. Yeah. All right. So I have bad news for you. Unfortunately, you thought you saw your last lecture from a Waterloo professor, but you're stuck with me for the next 20 minutes. Um, but I'm here to tell you that we're not just a machine for producing amazing interns. We also do some really great research, and hopefully you'll agree. So even at that institution, I direct what I think is the coolest lab at the University of Waterloo. We're called the Software Rebels. And it's not just a cool name, it's an acronym for what we do. So the RE part of Rebels stands for Repository Excavation, which is just a fancy word for saying data science for software engineers. So we mine your Git archives, we mine your issue trackers, and we try and generate insight about software engineering. The BE part stands for build engineering, or more broadly, like DevOps, DevSecOps, these kinds of large pipelines. So we combine these two fields and work on uh, insights that help to improve uh, the world, I think. And we're kind of on a mission. So since 2015, when I began my uh, academic career, we've been working towards this mission of uh, enabling the development, maintenance, and operation of intelligent DevOps pipelines. So trying to provide more intelligent solutions that are easier to maintain, operate faster, these kinds of things. And you know, over the last nine years or so, so I guess my academic career is about as old as Basil. We learned that uh, uh, in the keynote this morning. Um, we've kind of... Uh, achieved a bunch of things, which I'm especially proud of. So first, uh, we work with industry to develop tailored solutions to their problems. So we've improved DevOps pipelines at Ubisoft using uh, techniques we call build outcome prediction to bundle and uh, improve build speed. 
We've worked with organizations like Shopify who are beginning their data science movement, and we helped with that. Um, we've helped Sony Mobile to improve their uh, code review process, and we also helped Dell EMC by providing build level information at code review time. Uh, we've made core contributions to patented inventions at uh, smaller organizations like Yourbase, which was a startup company, and Garrett Forge, uh, which is uh, an organization built around the Garrett uh, code review tool. And, uh, you know, over the years, I'm especially proud that my group has a, uh, been ranked among the top software engineering researchers in the world. So. Now let's get to the topic at hand. So it's, it's, we all know that it's very easy to mess up automated builds, right? We care about a lot of traits that we would like to improve, right? So we want our builds to be efficient, and that might mean you know, we want to minimize resource utilization. We want to accelerate them to get them to run fast. We care also about them being correct, so that means that they're sound, they make sane decisions about when to skip steps or when to run full builds. We want them to be reproducible, meaning that we get bit for bit the same output for the same inputs. We care about things like item potency, we care about them being hermetic, and we also care about this other side, which is them being maintainable, right? How many DevOps engineers do we have in the room who maintain Bazel scripts, right? So I imagine uh, you care about this as well, right? And that maintainability might mean we want them to be extensible and we want them to be debuggable, right? Now we're often told that these desirable traits are a trade-off. So if you want your builds to be fast, you have to compromise their speed or sorry, if you want our builds to be fast, we have to compromise on soundness. Or if we want our builds to be reproducible, we have to take some compromise in their debuggability, these kinds of things. But that's where Bazel comes to save the day, right? So we even see in some of the original web pages that you get both. You get a fast build and it's also sound, right? And I really like this for a couple of reasons. The first is this multilingual magic, which makes me think of, you know, like Lucky Charms or something. Um, but again, we're observing that there are some organizations that even though Basil exists, they're choosing not to use it, right? So why might that be the case? So first, let's see, like, Basil exists, how many people are actually using it? And uh, as an academic, we have access to a lot of data. In the current world, um, there's a data set called the World of Code that collects all the open source that we can get our hands on, right? Uh, and from that collection, what we did initially was we tried to draw a sample of projects that are meaningful. Because when we talk about open source and large collections of open source, we find a lot of like toy projects and things that aren't really serious projects. So we did three things. First, from this world of code, we select the non-forked repositories. We select projects that we consider of community interest. So these would be things that are starred a lot. Um, and we select projects that are active. So they're receiving lots of uh, commits. And from this, we end up with a sample of about 35,000 projects. Now, next, what did we do with that sample? Well, we wanted to pick up the ones that are using Bazel. So we used some of those data mining techniques I was telling you about to mine for repositories, that 35,000 set of repositories. We mined their main branches to select Bazel adopters. And what we found is that there were about 542 of them, which is about 1.5% of that sample. Might make you feel a little bit sad, but I think this is a promising sign because uh, Bazel is relatively 
recent technology compared to those Ford Pintos that I was talking about earlier. And there's like a really big list of options that folks have. So the fact that Basil has a, a market share of 1.5% in this sample of interesting projects is promising, I think. But again, like, are those 1.5% sticking with Basil? That's the question. So let's turn back to our Canadian rock for some more insight. Something special will receive Something boring swells You'll find your ears Like chimes and church bells So it seems that they're suggesting something is going to happen, right? Um, I hope there aren't any GNU make maintainers in the room. Um, so the question that we had when we set out to perform this study is, are projects abandoning Basil? Are they running back to their Ford Pintos, right? And I'm going to try to align the results of the study along three dimensions, right? So the first is, how prevalent is this abandonment phenomenon? The second is, uh, what's the reason that organizations might be abandoning Basel. And the third is, like, what are they replacing it with, right? It's one thing if they're moving from Basel to Buck. It's another thing if they're moving from Basel to Canoe Make, right? OK, so let's work our way through this one by one. And let's first talk about prevalence. So how did we detect how prevalent abandonment was. Well, we took this set of 542, and we did another set, a subset, um, where we looked at the head commit on the main branch to see if those same basal files exist. And we'll call that set the current adopters. Now, these circles aren't drawn to scale, OK? So uh, don't freak out yet. Um, and what we found is that that's, uh, that's 482. So if you do the math, that means about 11% of the projects in our set of Basil adopters ended up abandoning Basil. So, you know, that's not nothing, um, and it's an interesting phenomenon to look at, I think. And uh, you might be thinking, okay, well, those 11% that are abandoning, they might be like projects that didn't see the light. They might be like naive people who never figured it out, right? Well, what we looked at in that set is we found that 33% of those leavers, so one third of the projects that are leaving Basil, they left it uh, and they were associated with, let's call them uh, the, the captains of industry. So we had organizations like Google, Meta, uh, Reddit, et cetera. So like a large proportion of these abandoners are not people who haven't seen the light. Uh, so when we stratified by the top programming languages in these repositories that are abandoning Bazel, we, we saw some interesting things. Um, when we focus on the top five languages, we noticed that Go um, was the most prevalent. So of all the programming languages that you might be using, those who are using Go are more likely to abandon Basil than projects that are using something like C++. And then another, you know, criteria, another critique you might have for this is that um, you know, these projects might have just been playing with Basil for a little bit of time, and then they threw it away. So we did another study where we looked at how long were they adopting Basil before they abandoned it. So how long were they using it? And this is a box plot. Um, it just shows, like imagine that there's a dot inside this range for each project for how long it's been adopting Basil. And uh, that big horizontal line, that big vertical line at just over 500 is the median of that distribution. The edges of the boxes are at 25 and 75 percent, and then extends further to like a 95 percent confidence interval, you might think. So what do we observe? Well, the median project that abandoned Basil had been using it for more than a year. So I don't think these are like, you know, experimenters, but we'll see more about that later. 
So to conclude or wrap up this prevalence direction, what we're finding is that 11% of this curated sample of large and active projects abandoned Basel after a median of about 638 days of adoption. Next, let's, let's talk about this idea of figuring out why they were abandoning Basel. And to do this, um, we applied some qualitative research methods. So we took this set of current adopters and basal adopters, and we threw out the current adopters, leaving us just with the basal leavers. Um, and this is 61 different projects. Uh, and we mined their repositories for the event of basal abandonment and discovered 212 documents of abandonment. Now this falls into three different kinds of documents. We found the pull requests that removed the basal files. We found the community discussions around that abandonment. And we also found bug reports describing why they might be abandoning basal. We took that 212 uh, set of abandonment documents and myself and uh, my postdoctoral trainee, we went through each one of these and performed what's called thematic analysis. We'll see a little bit more about what that looks like in a slide. Um, but essentially what we produced is like a table that says for each one of these documents that describes the abandonment, what kind of recurrent themes are we discovering? So kind of like lifting a level of abstraction out of the direct um, documents up to some recurrent themes that might explain the phenomenon we're seeing, right? Okay, so what does thematic analysis look like? Well, I'm gonna explain it using this semi-real discussion I had with my postdoctoral trainee. So first I said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna read and we're gonna code, not like write code, but in code for each document together. So myself and the postdoc sat in the room together reading each one of these 212 documents uh, and coding them. So he was not enthused, but you know, okay, let's sit together and read these documents. You know, several weeks later, <laughs> we were finished. And he, you know, was very happy. Coding is complete. Amazing. Well, we're almost there. Now we need to, ch to code again, but this time independently. So we had this code book now that says these are the recurrent themes. Now we know what the codes should be, so let's go back over all 212 documents, but this time we're not gonna sit in the same room. We're gonna do it independent of each other. And you know, he was also not very excited about doing this, but then, you know, several more weeks pass, and we completed the task, you know, and we computed something that's called the inter-rater agreement score. So this is used to, to estimate how well uh, the two independent ratings agree with each other. So how often do we agree? And we found that our inter-rater agreement was excellent, meaning that like, we can trust the labels that are coming out, at least if you trust us too, right? And then I told him, I said, nice, so you know, maybe we should just do one more round to, and he cut me off and said, I'm moving to Calgary, <laughs> okay? But we did produce this set of seven different uh, recurrent themes that we observed in our sample. I'm gonna focus on six of them, um, and I'll walk you through what we observed. So the first recurrent theme was complaints about maintaining basal files and troubleshooting basal files. And uh, again, I am aware that I'm in a room full of basal experts, and let's just call this perceived maintenance and troubleshooting, okay? So don't take it personally. Um, and uh, what we found is about 20% of our sample uh, included some complaints about this, okay? Next, we saw that support and interoperability was a concern. Um, so they would mention things like the Apple support we heard about earlier, Windows challenges, et cetera. Um, and we found about 26% of our sample mentioned these concerns. Um, 
I should mention that these numbers are not going to sum up to 100% because a project may abandon for multiple reasons. So the numbers are going to not math to use current lingo. Um, another reason we've observed is uh, parity, or at least observed, uh, uh, yeah, perceived parity with native tool chains. So if you remember, we saw a lot of abandonment in projects that are using Go. We were able to kind of associate that with a Go build release that provided some caching features, and folks that were writing primarily Go projects felt that Bazel wasn't adding enough value to justify the cost. Not me, them, okay? <laughs> please, please, don't, don't kill me. <laughs> okay, and that was about 22% of those who were abandoning it. We also saw that there was some of this experimental adoption. So folks that just wanted to try out Bazel and then abandoned it afterwards. But this was not a very big proportion of what we saw. Only 4% of our sample. Now, this might be specific to open source, but I think it also affects uh, folks in industry as well. Uh, some organizations were mentioning that uh, they saw Bazel as a barrier, barrier to contribution, especially in the open source uh, ecosystem where you know, attracting external contributors is a big thing. If you uh, add another barrier, so adoption, maybe that person who would have contributed something to my organization now can't because I can't get the freaking thing to build, um, and that's a problem, right? And this came up in about 14% of our sample. And the last one is that people are not lemmings, but they are, you know, influenced by community trends. Okay, and some of them would mention, you know, we saw, for example, Kubernetes. Uh, was a big project that moved away from Bazel a few years ago. And uh, they mentioned that as the reason that they also wanted to move away from Bazel. Okay. So in terms of rationale, we saw that there were several themes that came up, but let's summarize them around kind of three directions. So there were technical challenges, there were team coordination and onboarding issues, and there were community trends that were influencing folks to move away from Bazel. Now, what are they replacing Bazel with? I'll do this one real quick. Um, so they're moving from Bazel to language-specific tools, um, like GoBuild and Swift's uh, package manager. Um, and they were moving to some of those classics, and we saw examples that included moving all the way back to GNU Make, which is very surprising. So what are they replacing it with? Well, they're replacing it with less feature-rich, language-specific, and even some conventional and platform-specific technologies. Now, I don't want this talk to kind of land as a negative thing, so Let's turn back to that Canadian rock for some hope. But I've heard a hope in the faceless man you know you'll never meet. So I get some hope from this study in a few ways. So first, oh, I move backwards again. Uh, we saw a few things. So first, um, we saw that for basal upgrades, uh, there were projects that were doing that. So we repeated the study using uh, that same curated sample and looked for projects that were moving from other technologies to Bazel. And we observed that about 8.7% upgraded to Bazel from another technology. Uh, and they were citing things like dependency management, they were citing things like faster builds as, the, as these themes, and you know, People are influenced by others, um, so that also was a reason. You know, they saw the cool kids over in some other project, and they wanted to join them. I gave you guys a compliment. You're the cool kids, right? Okay. So um, let's wrap this up. So what we observed is uh, that. Well, we've been talking about this desirable trade-off of traits, right? Um, 
so we've heard that you know you used to have to choose between duration and soundness. We used to have to choose between re reproducibility and debugability. Um, but Basil comes in to save the day, and we saw that in our sample of like large and active projects that are quite popular, 1.5% um, of those projects were adopting Basil, which is promising. We also turned to Canadian Rock to learn about, you know, why something special might be receding in favor of older technologies, right? And what we observed when we did a study uh, in a large setting, we observed that there are uh, trends of abandonment um, and that there are certain themes that are coming up, so technical challenges, team coordination, and community trends. And um, there are less feature-rich build tools that are replacing these technologies. Now, I don't want to get sued, so that's the name of the song that I've been ripping off. Uh, if you'd like to read the full report, um, you can scan that QR code on the left. Um, and I am actively doing a study with some of my other trainees on tooling to support the development of CMake. So if there are CMake folks who would like to participate, you'd get a chance to play with some research prototypes and let us know what you think. That would be really great. Um, yeah, my name's Shane. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Waterloo, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me. Thanks. Yes. Or, so, uh, on, on, in some way, nothing you said, I mean, it was great to see the, the data. It's not surprising. I would think open source compared to private industry, much smaller code bases, uh, the median or whatever, 75 quartile, and probably single language. So, it feels like a poor pairing uh, from the get go. What, you know? Have you thought about replicating, like, have you reached out to private industry on their, th like, do you have any samples of that in the paper or, because, uh, yeah. You're starting off, it seems like you're starting off from like a mismatched footing and so in that sense I would agree with the findings already also. Yeah, so th some of this I, I agree is due to the focus on open source. But I think there are a few things in the paper that I think translate also to the industry setting, right? Like the barrier to entry is a concern not only for attracting uh, external contributors, but also for hiring engineers. Like if folks don't know the technology, they're gonna struggle. And the other thing that I would point to is that um, like we, we did an in-depth study of Kubernetes, which I think is the most interesting case that abandoned Bazel, and uh, we found several interesting things there, so I, I would mention that. Um, the other point I would make is that I don't think that there are many companies lining up to let me look at their Bazel files. So I think it, it, while I agree that it would be really interesting to do such a study, like of actual companies that are using Bazel and why. Um, for practical reasons, that wasn't something we could do uh, immediately. But, you know, if all the people here want to let me mine their repositories, I'd be happy to do it. Thank you. So, uh, thanks for all the insights. Um, I guess what would be most interesting to me is actionable insights. So. Um, there, are, I think, Basil is not for everyone. Um, I mean, that can be used to excuse a lot of failings, but there are certainly cases where if, uh, the insight I'd be most interested in is if Basil had done X rather than Y, or if they would only do X, but they haven't done it yet, uh, we would have made a different decision. So I don't know if your paper goes into that level of de detail, but that would be the most actionable outcome of the study and be very interesting to, for us to understand. Yeah, absolutely. So the paper does include a section at the very end with lessons learned that I think I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about that. Okay, um, great. Yeah, so we offer things like, you know, 
suggestions for where the documentation could be improved, suggestions for um, you know, interoperability concerns, specific ones that were mentioned explicitly in the abandonment documents. Yeah, great. All kind right. of low-hanging fruit that you know, hopefully helps. All right. Good, thanks. I saw in the research that uh, there's analysis of projects that, that were on Bazel and then dropped it for a variety of reasons. Was there any focus analysis on projects that tried to adopt Bazel but failed or abandoned for some reason, like never managed to change in the first place? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, so that would be kind of this, this one area that we found of experimental adoption that kind of failed, if I'm understanding your question correctly. I think um, those projects are examples where they were open to trying it, but it didn't work out. It wasn't a big set. It was only 4% of our, our sample of abandoners. Um, but yeah, it would be really interesting to dig a little bit deeper into a, you know, specifically why. And I, I think in our code book, we, we should have that. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in like looking at specific slices of the data, the paper itself includes what's called a replication package, which includes our code book of exactly which documents we labeled with exactly which reasons. Um, and I would invite you to, to take a look, yeah. Because I know there's some like very big headline examples of projects that have tried to adopt Bazel and failed, like uh, Android and things like that. The project was killed, and so I thought interesting to look at. Why do those things not work out? I hate to interrupt this question session. Uh, we are uh, ahead in the break, um, so find Shane um, somewhere and talk to him. Thank you for the presentation.